Good morning, afternoon, evening, and welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents, a new offering on Village TV. Concerned Citizens of Laguna Woods is an organization committed to peace, social justice, economic equality, and a clean environment. For the duration of the lockdown, instead of its usual two meetings a month, Concerned Citizens will broadcast two programs a month on this channel. Our programs will feature films, lectures, and debates on topics related to our mission. We hope you enjoy today's program. Welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents. My name is Suzanne Modell, and I host these broadcasts. Today, we are pleased to bring you a presentation based on a brand new book, Mine, How the Hidden Rules of Ownership Control Our Lives. The key word here is hidden. The book is replete with examples of how governments, corporations, and organizations claim ownership of goods, services, and information on what can best be described as fuzzy grounds. But until you read this book or hear Professor Heller's talk, you are unlikely to realize just how fuzzy those grounds are. Michael Heller is co-author with James Saltzman of Mine and sole author of The Gridlock Economy, How Too Much Ownership Wrecks Markets, Stops Innovation, and Costs Lives. In that volume, he analyzes situations in which competition among owners prevents consumers from accessing a desirable good. His analysis is considered a major contribution to the field of property law. Michael Heller holds a BA from Harvard and a JD from Stanford. Upon graduation, he worked for the World Bank among his assignments was advising governments in former communist countries on housing reform. In 1994, he began teaching law at the University of Michigan. And in 2002, he moved to Columbia, where he was offered the Lawrence Veen Professorship in Real Estate Law. Finally, I would like to thank one of our members, Carol Novick, for recommending Professor Heller to the Concerned Citizens Program Committee. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Michael Heller. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Carol, and thank you, Ruthie. This is really so nice to be here. It's a treat uh, to be here with each of you. Uh, so today we're going to start by going to the airport, which is a place I haven't visited uh, in, in quite a while, and I imagine many of you have not um, either. So I'm gonna start with a true story. This is a saga. There's a hero and a villain. I'm not gonna tell you who is which. Uh, this is James Beach. He's a big guy, he's over six feet tall, frequent business traveler. He was on a crowded flight uh, from Newark to Denver, about halfway back there, middle seat, row 12. Um, after takeoff, he lowers his tray table, takes out his laptop, he also takes out his knee defenders. These are little clamps uh, in the circled in the photo there. And he clamps them to the front of the tray table uh, in front of him. These just cost 21 bucks on the internet. Uh, they, what they do is they lock the seat in front of you in place. The idea is according to the advertising, they will stop reclining seats on an airplane so your knees won't have to. So with his knee defenders in place, he opens his laptop and he starts typing. Uh, the knee defenders really work. Uh, the passenger sitting in front of James uh, couldn't recline her seat. She realized there was a problem. She eventually slams her seat back, which pops out the knee defenders, jolts the laptop, and has it flying into James's uh, lap. He jams his seat back up, reattaches the clamps. And at that point, the confrontation took a turn for the worse. The woman in front threw her cup of water in James's face. So we don't know how this might have escalated. The pilot here changed course to Chicago, an emergency landing, took both of the passengers off the plane. They were perhaps somewhat abashed, and the flight continued to Denver about an hour and a half late. A similar event happened a week later. Um, these high altitude brawls quickly went viral. 
the blogosphere booms back and forth with self-righteous claims. This space is mine. These fights over reclining seats may seem foolish, kind of stupid, but it turns out they reveal a great deal about how the hidden rules of ownership really work. So I'm going to ask three questions to frame the first half of my talk. Why is reclining an ownership conflict? Why are these battles breaking out now? And who is the villain and who is the hero? So I wanna start with the first question. Why is reclining an ownership conflict? The fight may simply be, can I recline or not? But there is more going on. The real conflict here is over control of that yellow wedge of space behind the seat. Who owns the wedge? The recliner in front or the knee defender in back? Conflicts occur with every part of your flying experience. So what happens, for example, with your shared armrest? Who gets the armrest? There's that unspoken jostling over that space. Um, a clever entrepreneur actually designed the slide here as a slide of an armrest divider, which you can pick up and stick on your armrest to divide the space between you and your neighbor. There's also conflicts over the overhead space, uh, the space underneath your seat, whether the window shade is up or down, every inch on board is contested. And that's even more true today with concerns over social distancing. And this is true, not just on airplanes. Ownership invisibly shapes every day of our lives, every minute. These are the rules that decide who gets what and why. It's whether you stand at the front of the line or at the back. It's where you live. It's what medications you take. It's where you drive. Hundreds of times a day, we encounter decisions over who gets what. And they're all decided by a very small handful of ownership rules. And most of these operate completely outside the law. This is something that's very hard to get across to lawyers and law students, but law is highly overrated. And this is true all over the world. It always has been, and it always will be. Our drive to own is hardwired. It goes way back in our evolutionary history. And not just for humans, all species compete for control of scarce and valuable resources. When you see birds singing, it seems bucolic, but it would seem different if you knew what the birds were actually saying, which is back off. And we humans are absolutely no different. If you spend time in a playground, you hear kids shouting one word and you all know what that word is. It is mine, 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 and it is mine. This is one of the first words kids speak in every culture around the world. And this word only grows in importance as we all grow older. We hear a lot of sayings about ownership all the time. Um, I put a few up on the screen, but all of you can think of many more. We learn these sayings about ownership at a very early age. We think about ownership in a way that becomes so ingrained, we don't even realize it. We're like fish in water. And it's not just in these very common sayings. If you think for a minute about the creation legends of Western civilization, um, for example, Greek mythology, what is the catalyst for the birth of civilization? It's when Prometheus steals fire from the gods on Mount Olympus. He pays a terrible price for taking what does not belong to him. His eagle, his liver is torn out every day by an eagle. It's like a really bad version of the movie Groundhog Day meets maybe meets birds. Anyway, human ownership of fire, that is what sparks civilization. This is also true in the Bible in the Garden of Eden story. It turns on ownership. Adam and Eve are punished for taking something that is not theirs. They were evicted from the garden. At this point, trespassing exists. And God doesn't just change the locks. He stations the archangel Michael uh, there at the edge of the garden with a flaming sword. Don't come back. Adam and Eve leave. And that is when human history begins. Mine has remained up for grabs ever since. Why does ownership feature so centrally 
in these creation myths. My co-author Jim and I argue that at its core, human society exists to help us deal with competing claims to ownership, to food, water, sexual partners, territory, so we don't kill each other too often. So with that, I wanna come back to the first question. Why is reclining in an airplane seat an ownership issue? And the answer is that whenever people want the same thing, whenever there is not enough to go around, then ownership is up for grabs. And that is everywhere and always. From the Garden of Eden to that wedge of reclining space behind seats at 35,000 feet and every place in between. And that brings me to the second question. Why are these battles breaking out now? Didn't used to happen. Planes didn't used to make these kinds of emergency landings over these fights. No one thought to ask who controlled that wedge of space because there was enough space for everyone. And that's just not true anymore. Tray table space has become quite valuable for laptops. People have gotten larger. And most importantly, airlines have been shrinking the pitch. That's the distance between seats. Not that long ago, it was 35 inches. Today, on some planes, it's down to just 28 inches. Every inch of pitch that's saved per row adds up to six extra seats per flight to sell. So what airlines are doing is shrinking more passengers into that same fixed tube. And as our personal space shrinks, that wedge becomes ever more valuable. We are getting madder at each other because most of us assume that the wedge is up for grabs and it's available for either passenger to claim. Ambiguity about who controls that wedge turns out to be the key to solving the first ownership puzzle. The ambiguity is not an accident. Airlines do have a rule. You have a right to recline. They never announce the rule. They rarely enforce the rule. And why is that? And the answer is that airlines are masters of ownership design. Those inches of space, that is their core product. And they engineer them using one of the most advanced tools of ownership design, a tool that I call deliberate ambiguity. When ownership is ambiguous about that yellow wedge of space, airlines know that what we are going to do, almost all of us, is fall back on politeness and on good manners, not on law and not on rules. While we're trying to work it out between ourselves with each other, airlines are profiting. Deliberate ambiguity lets the airlines sell that wedge of space twice on every seat, on every flight. They sell it for you to recline and to me again for my knees and my laptop. And even better for the airlines, that is, it's the conflict that they've created in economy class. That's what creates the market for higher price seats up front with enough leg room and no hassle. So the answer to the second question, why are these battles breaking out now? It's because airlines are using an advanced tool of ownership design to profit from the conflict that they've created. It's actually for that reason that most airlines have banned knee defenders. They, it's very important to them to preserve ambiguity about control of that wedge of space. That brings us to our third question. Who's the hero and who's the villain? Uh, to answer this, we actually need to expand our cast of characters a little bit beyond James Beach. Uh, you all may recall this image from a video that went viral last year. Uh, that's Wendy Williams in the front there in the red sweater. She's just reclined her seat. The guy behind is in the back row. He can't lean back. So she's pretty much in his lap. He's gotten really mad. And what he's doing with his hand there is banging the back of her seat, like a metronome, like a super irritating metronome. Um, she takes a video of this and posts it and millions of people uh, watch. So here's the question I have for you all, which is who's the jerk in the video? Uh, who's in the right, the recliner or the guy in back? Wendy Williams in front or James Beach in back? Now, usually when I do this talk, I put up a poll at this point, but given our technological challenges, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but I want you to think for a second, who do you think is in the right? Is it okay to recline your airplane seat on a crowded flight if someone's behind you? And one answer is no, you shouldn't do it. Don't recline. And the other answer is 
sure, if it can recline, I'm reclining. So just think for a second about what your answer would be. Um, when I give this, when I ask that question to audiences, um, usually in a crowd of, if it's a crowd of 500, it'll split almost perfectly down the middle, 250 and 250. Um, with smaller numbers, it might skew one way or the other, depending on gender or age or nationality. Um, for those of you who support leaning back, who support Wendy, Ellen DeGeneres agrees with you. She says, unless the seat punches you, don't punch back. If you support the no recline position, James Beach, keep out of my lap, uh, Delta CEO Ed Bastien agrees with you. He says, uh, it's rude, and Wendy should have asked uh, before leaning back. But almost invariably, when I ask this question of audiences, polls split about 50-50. And what's surprising is not your own view. But if I, even in this crowd, um, what might surprise you is how many of your neighbors here today disagree with you. So how can that be? And what's going on here is that what's mine may seem obvious and natural to each of us. But this ownership conflict, like every ownership conflict, is really a storytelling battle. And what's remarkable is that when things first come to be owned, like that wedge of space, the battle always draws from just six simple stories. So for those of you who are with Wendy and like are into reclining on the airplane, what you're asserting is what I call the attachment story. The wedge of space is attached to and therefore belongs to the front seat. The button controls the wedge. This idea of attachment is one of the world's oldest legal principles. It dates back thousands of years. It's mine because it is attached to something mine. When you say my home is my castle, you're invoking attachment. That's why you own the oil and water underneath your house. That's why you own some airspace above. Attachment is the most important ownership principle you have never heard of. Turns out to be the most important tool we have actually to address climate change. For those of you who vote with James Beach, who say, hey, uh, the knee defender, this is my space. That's a different story. You're saying possession. Possession is nine tenths of the law. That space is mine because I'm holding on to it. Possession is just as fundamental as attachment. It traces back to those animal instincts with the dogs and the birds. James is saying, my knees, my laptop hold the space. It is mine. So when the seat reclines, it feels like a trespass. Attachment and possession are two of just the six simple stories we all use to claim everything in the world, everything. Third story is first in time, first come, first served. It's mine because I got it first. This is how kids line up for ice cream cones at the Good Humor truck. This is how countries put um, satellites in geosynchronous orbit. Fourth story is labor. It's mine because I worked for it. This story goes back to the Bible. You reap what you sow. Reward for labor is a really powerful intuition. It's why, for example, we grant patents to inventors and copyrights to artists. Fifth story is self-ownership. It's mine because it comes from my body, our bodies, ourselves. This is the ownership story at stake when we fight um, over whether we should be able to sell our kidney or whether college athletes should be able to profit from their celebrity. Final story, sixth story is family. It's mine because I'm in the family. We may say the meek shall inherit the earth, but the reality of family ownership is way more troubling. And turns out we now live in a country in America that has very generous rules for the super rich and a different, much harsher set of rules for the rest of us. Um, so one response you might have is you might say, well, hold on a second, people sold or gave me most of what I own. And that's not on this six story list. But I would ask you back, where did they get it from? And the answer is they got it from someone who sold it to them and so on back and back and back through time, all ownership traces back to some original somebody um, who is asserting one of these simple stories. Conflicts arise when you assert one of the stories and I, ass I assert another. What happens is that we each say mine. We each assert the moral high ground. We each insist on the rightness of, our, of the story that advances our view, not realizing 
that there are these other equally valid stories out there. And here's the important thing. The reclining seat battle uh, may seem trivial, but it is playing out all across our economy and with far higher stakes than a wedge of space on an airplane. So more and more, it turns out, we live our lives on the internet uh, as we struggle with Zoom. Our internet activities reveal an enormous amount of information, the most intimate information about our lives. It's what we buy, it's where we travel, uh, it's even our health status, how we vote. All that data is known as our clickstream. So if you've ever wondered, for example, why it is that after you search for an airline ticket for, to go to San Francisco for the weekend, uh, for the next week, uh, you get ads popping up for San Francisco hotels and restaurants. And the answer is that the travel website is tracking your activities everywhere you go online. And it's selling that information to advertisers. Our click streams, our likes and our looks, these are worth hundreds of billions of dollars. It's this information that powers much of the internet. We often frame this concern about this tracking as a privacy concern, but it really turns on ownership. And one of the central questions for our time is, should you own your clickstream or should the tech giants own it? Normally I would poll you at this point and I would guess in this crowd and mostly for most audiences, about three quarters of you, most of you, but not all, would say that you should own your clickstream. And a quarter of you say, no, that's the price I pay for having Facebook, for example, uh, be free or Google be free. Um, but however you come out with that, that battle over who owns the clickstream is playing out right now. Uh, and it demonstrates a really deep and broad dynamic that faces all of us. Whenever there is any new valuable resource, whenever it emerges, whether it's the wedge of space or our online data or space for satellites, ownership is ambiguous at first. And in this case, online, web companies are rushing into that ambiguity. They're, claim, they're staking that claim for their click streams for themselves. And here's the thing. The settings couldn't be more different, but it's the same exact ownership stories in seat reclining and on the web. What Facebook and Amazon are doing is they're telling an attachment story. Their data trackers are like the button on the airplane seat. Our clickstream uh, data attaches to their apps. But we can respond to that. We don't have to buy their story. We can claim possession. We can say their, trust, their trackers are trespassing into our most intimate lives. So the online battle is possession versus attachment all over again. Facebook and Amazon are leaning their data trackers into our virtual lives. And we can maybe create uh, virtual knee defenders to keep the tech giants uh, out. So here's the thing, Europe actually has done this. California, where you all are, has done this up to a point. Uh, California has given you some control over your data privacy, not very much, but some, more than zero. In the rest of America and the rest of the world, you have zero control over this. Ownership of your data remains very much up in the air. And the first step as concerned citizens, as activists worried about issues like data privacy is to realize that it's not a given that you don't own your data. It's a choice. And you are in the middle of a storytelling battle right now for the fate of your online life. So I wanna close the circle and put a bracket on seat reclining. What are the lessons that we can take from seat reclining? There's three lessons I wanna get across and then we'll move on. Lesson one, ownership conflicts are all around us. Whenever people want the same stuff, there is an ownership battle and that is everywhere and always. As resources become scarcer, uh, the storytelling battles become more intense. And when we fight those stories, there are just six simple stories. And this is true in every corner of the world. Now you may have noticed so far, I'm mostly using American examples. Different cultures will emphasize one story or another, but everyone everywhere always is choosing from the same simple storybook. Third, ownership is up for grabs. It is always a choice. You should never be intimidated by someone saying, this is the rule, this is the law, this is the way. There was never a necessary or correct answer for who gets what. So in the uh, back half of this time uh, from my initial presentation, I wanna open a window for you all into how ownership, the hidden rules of ownership, what Suzanne started, started us with, how those hidden rules 
really work. And I want to go back to some of our early sayings, the basic sayings. My home is my castle. Possession is nine tenths of the law. First come, first serve. The reason these stories are so powerful is because they just feel right. They feel natural, fair, simple. But here's the thing. Much of what you know about these stories turns out to be wrong. In practice, more and more, the real ownership story is my home is not my castle. Possession is one-tenth of the law. First come is last served. Savvy governments and businesses already know this. They are highly skilled at engineering the six simple stories of ownership to steer you to do what they want, like with the airplane wedge. And to see how this works, we could pick any of those stories. Uh, today, for this audience, I'm going to pick one of them, which is the last one on the screen now, first come, uh, first served. So first come, first served has been the rule for how people initially claim most stuff for most of human history. When you're at the deli and you want a bagel, it's first in line, step on up. Same at the DMV to get your driver's license. This is how water rights are divided up in the American West. They use a rule called prior appropriation. The first to put the water to beneficial use owns the water. First in time is first in right. Uh, this is how family wealth is passed down for most of history. Inheritance went uh, to the firstborn son. That's why in this picture, um, Jacob is tricking um, Isaac uh, in the Bible so he can claim his older brother Esau's uh, inheritance. Kids are taught from a very early age to line up to get, to, to get everything. And you can see why this, of the, of the six ownership stories, why this one is so powerful. It seems intuitive, seems fair. It's very easy to apply and enforce, even for kids on the playground without parents policing. Here's the thing though, who is first does not define itself, not ever. This is one of the hardest challenges of training young lawyers is for them to realize uh, that first in time, who is first is not an empirical fact. It never is. It never is. Oh, I know who's first. You were first. I was first. That's no, it is, that feels empirical. First in time is never an empirical fact. It is always a story. It is always a choice. It is always up for grabs who and what counts as first. And to show you how this works, I want to uh, bring you, actually, we're going to go 20 miles north from where you all are on the five. So northwest, right? 20 miles northwest from where you are brings you to the world capital master of line management, and that is Disneyland. Disneyland markets itself as the most magical place on earth. 58 million visitors a year, America's top honeymoon destination. Do you know, I guess many of you may know this, when is Disney not the most magical place on earth? And the answer is when you're waiting five hours for a five minute ride on Space Mountain. Forget about it. Even when you get inside the ride, there's another long wait. Uh, grandkids are not known for their patience. Uh, so first in time created a real problem, real headache for Disney. Long lines annoyed too many customers. Disney couldn't engineer the ride to accommodate more riders per hour. So the challenge for Disney became, could they engineer ownership instead? Could they profit from those long lines? And what they did is they introduced something called a fast pass, which lets families skip the regular line for a fixed short line later in the day. If you plan ahead, you can get three of these with your price of admission per day. So if you know kids want to take the Seven Dwarfs train there in the picture, kind of grumpy for the long line, with a fast pass, uh, not so grumpy anymore, kind of happy instead. So this is a win-win. But in particular, what fast pass does is, is it provides a win for Disney. So what fast pass was designed to do was to get grumpy families moving around and spending money, not angrily idling in line. So this is no longer you know, old fashioned first in time. It's a different definition of who and what counts as first. But this change for most people feels pretty open, pretty fair, pretty accessible. Anybody can get a fast pass if they plan ahead. Question for Disney though was, can they do even better? Can they design first in time to profit directly from the line waiting hassle the company created? And here's where Disney took the next step, what I view as the genius step 
in ownership design. There are a fair number of wealthy people who have a lot more money than time. So for them, Disney created something called the private VIP tour. It's like a super duper fast pass. It lets you skip every line, every ride all day long, and it just costs three to $5,000 um, on top of the price of admission. So if your family wants to spend the entire day riding Splash Mountain, you, know, you wanna go five times in a row with no waiting, knock yourselves out. What Disney now does with the VIP pass is it profits directly from the long lines it has created. This is the exact same ownership design structure as the airlines creating a market for business class seats by ensuring misery in economy. But there was a catch for Disney, which is different from the airlines. If Disney visibly moves too many people to the front of the line, they risk angering all those grumpy families who are patiently waiting. So what Disney does is they assign a guide uh, to discreetly help each group of uh, uh, families um, uh, get in. So what you have here in this picture is a guide bringing its group in, his group in uh, through the exit. Sometimes they bring you in through the side door. Uh, the problem for Disney was that old fashioned first in time left too much money on the table. So it redesigned what, what and who counts as first. First with the fast pass and then with the so-called VIP tour. All of those families who are still waiting patiently in line, they cannot tell that anything is amiss. They never realize that the real rule in Disneyland has become first come, last served. It's not just Disney that's doing this. First come, last served is quietly becoming standard practice across our economy. Um, we've already seen airlines as masters of wedge design. Um, they also profit from re-engineering uh, first in time. When I was younger, and some of you may remember this, if you got to the airport early, uh, you could just get on the plane earlier. When you if you whoever showed up first could, could board first. Uh, that is no longer true. Getting there early gives you no advantage whatsoever. Um, I was recently Ruby class on some airline. I thought, wow, this means I'm going to get to board first. Um, and it turns out I was boarded at the end of the line. The, the, you know, Ruby class, that semi-precious metal or gem, turns out to be relatively late boarding. You need to be you know, platinum, diamond, something to board earlier. So airlines as well are very savvy masters of designing rules uh, for who gets to the front. For them, it's about maximizing customer loyalty and uh, having people pay for a more expensive uh, ticket. So if you want to get to the front of the line for an airline, fly often, pay full fare. It's not just businesses that are savvy engineers of um, first in time. Governments are also in on this uh, game. Uh, the highway fast lane used to be available first come, first served. Whoever got into the fast lane could, could use it. That's not true anymore. So if you think about the five, in many cities, in many states, um, those, uh, that fast lane has been transformed into an HOV lane, high, high occupancy vehicle lane, reserved for carpools, uh, sometimes for electric vehicles. Why? The goal there is not to maximize revenue, like with Disney, uh, but for uh, cleaner air or less pollution from the daily commute. So uh, the highway departments changed who is first, what counts as first, uh, and, uh, and to address a concern about the environment. Um, but that isn't the only thing governments do. So this may not be true in Southern California, um, but governments as well don't want to leave money on the table. Uh, where I grew up in DC, this is um, uh, the highway getting into DC from the Virginia suburbs. If you want to get into downtown DC during rush hour quickly, um, and you're a solo driver in a gas guzzler, uh, that's no problem. Uh, you just, and, and if, you, if you see on the screen there, if you pay $30 and 75 cents, uh, you can uh, be in the uh, high occupancy vehicle uh, lane. So um, the base is known as congestion pricing. Uh, it's similar to the VIP pass, uh, but everybody uh, can, uh, can see it. Here's what I want you, want you to focus on. What holders of valuable resources are doing in all of the examples today is they're using their ownership like a remote control. They're basically using their, the rules around who, is, who gets what, who's first, what counts as possession, What's, who counts, what's, what's attachment. They're using that to steer you to do what they want, quietly and invisibly. You don't even realize that you're being steered. What Disney did is they redesigned first uh, twice. Uh, Fast Pass gets families out of line and steers them to basically spend all their time in the park uh, uh, buying things, going back and forth between rides, spending money and making merchandise. 
the VIP pass uh, steers the wealthiest to pay thousands um, quietly to jump the queue. Uh, the low value customers are the ones who are left waiting in endless lines. They're the only ones left still playing uh, by the old rules. Airlines are defining first for boarding priority to encourage brand loyalty. Highway departments are defining first to promote carpooling or low emission cars or to raise money. Whatever their goal is, they use ownership design as the tool uh, to get there. In all of these cases, what ownership does is it works as a form of ownership engineering. What businesses and governments are doing is they are redefining first to direct our behavior to steer us to do what they want. So you may feel like you're still playing by first in time. And the real rule more often is not that. It's first come, last served. Anywhere you see a long line, uh, creative entrepreneurs can profit by re-engineering first. This is one of my favorite examples. Again, this is DC where I grew up. And I don't know how many of you recognize this image. Um, if you actually count the seats at the bench in front there, you'll count nine seats and you'll say, aha, I know what that is. That's the Supreme Court. Supreme Court is the, actually the best free show in Washington, D.C. Uh, you can sit um, uh, uh, steps from the justices. Uh, those benches at the bottom of the screen, those are all free seats. Um, and they're available for the public. That's a very scarce resource. And what that means is um, uh, people line up uh, pretty early. Entrance to the Supreme Court for those free tickets, for those free entrance, is first come, first served. So people line up well ahead of time for big cases. But when something very strange happens um, just there at the front of the line, right before the doors open. All of the extremely raggedy, bedraggled people at the front of the line, they all of them step out of the line. And they, in there, in for each one of them, steps in somebody in a gray business suit carrying a briefcase. And that's, that's true as well for um, uh, lines for congressional hearings in DC as well, where the nation's laws are being written. Those, um, all those spaces um, are available to the public, first come, first serve. So what's going on here? What's going on is something that you may not know exists, it's something called the line standing industry. So this is one example here, linestanding.com. Uh, they charge their clients up to about $6,000 uh, for the free ticket to get in first to hear a Supreme Court argument. They pay minimum wage to hire the line standers who usually will wait uh, for days uh, in the rain and the cold to make sure that they're first. Uh, this has now become a standard expense for lawyers and lobbyists in DC uh, to pay for these services. Uh, so if you want, so today, if any of you were to go to DC when we start flying again and wanted to go see a big Supreme Court argument or you know, see how the laws are being made that you guys are advocating around, uh, the odds are that you will not be able to get in. Uh, this is also a big business in the private sector. If you wanna be at the front of the line for Broadway show, a uh, new iPhone, Macy's Day Parade, Whatever it is, uh, all of those uh, front of the line spaces are being taken today by paid line standers. Uh, the Shark Tank picture there is a guy paid, um, uh, who wanted to be a contestant on the show and paid a line stander to wait for him for several days to get on the show. Um, if I asked, if I polled you, um, do you think this is unfair? Um, so sometimes the way I frame the question is, is it okay to pay someone to hold your spot in a long line and then jump in when it's your turn? I should be curious what this crowd thinks. Um, so uh, uh, usually the crowd splits about half and half. Um, about half people say, yeah, it's okay. Uh, no, one behind us, no one behind me is harmed if I waited or if I pay someone to wait for me. And about half of you would probably say, uh, no, it, it feels wrong uh, to have someone in line uh, pay for me. Now, actually, let, let me revise my guess. You're the concerned citizens of Laguna Woods. So my guess is that you all would probably say no paid line standing. And I see Suzanne shaking her head in agreement. Uh, when I've given this, for example, at a school, Jim and I, Jim, my co-author teaches at a school, school of the environment. And there about three quarters of the students uh, are with you guys. They would say no paid line standing. When I give this to my law students, about three quarters um, say it's, it's fine to have paid line standing. Anyway, however you vote, however you think in your mind about this, this is an ownership choice. How you structure a line is an ownership choice like every other piece of access to every other resource in the world. But here's the point. The shift that's quietly happening to first come last served isn't just about money. There's also some really deep democratic values at stake here. It's 
you know, with old fashioned first in time, that rewards those who have the spare time needed to get there first. First come last served rewards wealth. It favors those who can pay for the time of others. And that's what's happening quietly across our economy. Owners are rewriting the first in time story from time to money, from equality to privilege, and from first to last. So next time that you're waiting in a long line, ask yourself, like, are those ahead of you being paid to wait? And what does that mean for you as a citizen and as a consumer? I want to give you one more everyday example and then uh, wrap things up. Uh, so this is an example that starts to snap into focus when you understand how these hidden rules of ownership work. Uh, this is a picture of a food truck. It's a very cutthroat world. Normally, public parking uh, on the streets is first come, first served. Uh, so food trucks, that means, you know, they arrive early in the day to park in most American cities in prime downtown spots. They get there early, claim the space. This is an important pathway for recent immigrants who are trying to um, uh, claim um, uh, a route uh, into the establishing a small business. These downtown bricks and mortar restaurants though, don't like food trucks. Uh, food trucks pay no rent, they pay lower taxes. So food trucks in many cities have lobbied their city councils to change parking rules, to redesign who and what counts as first so they could eliminate competition. They can't do it directly because of antitrust laws, but you can do it indirectly by just defining who is first. Food trucks basically say first in time means first to park there that day. Restaurants say no, they were there first, different meaning to first, um, and uh, they should be able to prevent food trucks from parking anywhere nearby. So city councils in many American cities in recent years, like Chicago, Baltimore, a bunch of cities have listened to restaurant owners. And what they've done is they've prohibited food trucks from parking within 200 feet of uh, bricks and mortar restaurants. And what that means pretty much is no parking for a food truck anywhere downtown. Um, so what that's meant for restaurants is it's been very profitable. It's been devastating though for immigrant entrepreneurs and for up and coming chefs who often start out as well in food trucks. Chicago, for example, now has this ban in place. Chicago only has 70 food trucks and a super boring street food scene. Uh, Portland, Oregon, which is the slide I have on the screen now, Portland is a quarter the size of Chicago. It has no parking restrictions. It has over 500 trucks. It has one of the most vibrant food scenes uh, in America. Anyway, next time you're walking in any downtown, along with noticing how lines are working, notice the presence or absence of food trucks. Very tiny hidden changes to who and what counts as first shapes the entire food economy of a city. We are always engineering first in time. It is a powerful story because each of these ownership stories feels natural and fair. And it is always up for grabs. You can see this right now actually with uh, battles over access to the COVID vaccine. And everyone agreed, you know, health, line, health workers should be first. But after that, there was no agreement. Should it be the elderly? Should it be prisoners, teachers? In New Jersey, next to me, it was smokers got priority for some reason. But each group was arguing uh, who counts as first to promote their particular set of values. Paid line standards for in, the, in the last year have all shifted over. The industry no longer is buying iPhones, basically being paid to wait in line for uh, COVID testing a few months ago and COVID vaccines up until very recently. COVID vaccines don't administer themselves. Uh, you know, the owners of those vaccines, the states in most cases, are always facing a choice to define who is first. All right, I'm circling around to the end here. Um, I showed you this slide um, earlier in the talk. Uh, one kid is shouting, mine, I'm holding on to it. And the other is screaming, no, mine, I had it first. And now, at the end of this talk, you know that this is not just a screaming match. It's a storytelling battle between possession and first in time. And those are two of just six simple stories everyone uses to claim everything. And you also know what's remarkable to me, and was a big discovery for me in writing this book, is that businesses and governments use those exact same six stories. They use them to decide who can recline, who owns your clickstream, who gets vaccines first, 
and hundreds of other ownership conflicts that are all around us um, every day. This is a form of social engineering. So today with you, I focused on first come first served, but savvy owners have figured out how to basically turn all of the ownership stories upside down to get you to do what they want. So for example, I'm gonna talk about some of these in the Q and A, uh, but Amazon and Apple, for example, have redefined uh, what it means to have online possession. Nine tenths of the law, it's mine. Online possession is just one tenth of the law. The buy now button doesn't mean what you think it means. A little shopping cart doesn't mean what you think it means. There's a growing gap between what you feel you own and what you actually own. And that means you pay Amazon and Apple extra on every download. Um, governments, businesses, we are all turning these stories upside down. Governments sometimes do it for the common good. So as I started at the beginning, um, our very best solutions for addressing climate change all involve redesigning um, the attachment story. Remember the reclining button on the seat? That reclining button turns out to be the key for um, solving climate change. Um, so I'll just give you a few parting puzzles and then I'll stop. Um, once you know where to look, the hidden rules of ownership define so many, explain so many puzzles. So for example, why is it that HBO actually encourages, doesn't just tolerate, but encourages you to um, illegally share your passwords, which they do. Um, how is it that you can sell some body organs like blood plasma, but not others like your spare kidney? Um, how did Amazon engineer that buy now button? I just mentioned that one. They basically get an unearned premium on every download. Um, how is it that South Dakota has become the world's leading money haven. If you're super rich on this call, this is not news to you. Um, but South Dakota today has crushed Switzerland and the Cayman Islands as the go-to place uh, for hiding money. And what does that mean that South Dakota can do this for the rise of America's new wealth um, aristocracy? Those puzzles and a hundred more snap into focus when you look at them through the lens of ownership. So I wanna leave you today before we move to Q&A with a challenge, which is if you pick up the newspaper today or tomorrow or next week, any day, I guarantee I'm 100% confident that there will be a front page story that turns on ownership. And the reason I can be sure is that there are just six simple stories and they frame every struggle over the things we all want. That's a lot of things. Once you see how it works, you can't unsee it. And once you can see it, you can begin to be a more effective advocate for change. That was one of Suzanne's questions to me when, I decided, when she asked me to come to you, is how, what does it mean for you all as concerned citizens to be able to act um, out in the world? And uh, what I want very much for all of you is to be able to see that these stories exist. And it's by seeing it, that's the sort of entry point in to being able to take uh, effective action as concerned citizens. If you'll allow me just one minute before I turn it back to Suzanne. Um, I have a website for the book. It's uh, mindthebook.com. Um, so it's, it's up there, um, it was up there on the screen a minute ago. I'll put it back up in a minute more. Um, on the website, we have a lot more. I mean, what's most important for us about this book is getting the message out. And we have a lot of resources up there uh, that you can use. So for example, we have a bunch of videos about ownership stories. They're all two minutes long. Um, that are kind of cool and fun. We have a bunch of excerpts from the book. So if you're not sure you want to buy the book, uh, you can read some of the uh, cooler stories uh, for free um, on the website. We also have access to a bunch of reviews, the New Yorker review, the New York Times review. Um, my heart, I had an article in the Washington Post a few weeks ago. A lot of the media around the issues we've talked about today um, is on the website and that's all available, um, all available as well. Anyway, thank you so much. And with that, I think I'm more or less on time. And let me turn it back to Suzanne. Concerned citizens, thanks Michael Heller for his thoughtful presentation. He has expanded our awareness of the complexities of ownership. In their book, Mine, professors Heller and Saltzman show that not only objects, but ideas, data files, and body parts are up for grabs. The book also expands our awareness of our rights. Rights not only to the space behind our airline seat, but to the water under our home, 
or to the belongings of our deceased parents, or to our credit ratings, or to our medical records. Having heard this talk, we will doubtless pay more attention to who controls access to the goods and services that we use every day, and to who controls access to the data that we generate every time we go on the internet, use our cell phones, or don a digital watch. Finally, concerned citizens thanks you, our audience, for joining us for this informative broadcast. We look forward to seeing you again next time.